the Biochemical Society and Portland Press are pleased to welcome you to this webinar, which is part of our biochemistry focused webinar series. Topics in the series include research highlights from many areas of the molecular biosciences and also practical sessions to support career development. Each webinar gives you an opportunity to ask questions by text. We also welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in our webinar series. Please see the webinar for more details. I am Patricia Kuwabara, professor at the University of Bristol and a trustee of the Royal Society of Biology. The mission of the Royal Society of Biology, or RSB, is to be the unifying voice for biology, to facilitate the promotion of new discoveries in biological science for national and international benefit, and to engage the wider public with our work. I would like to highlight that the Royal Society of Biology is currently celebrating Biology Week by showcasing the amazing world of the biosciences through a number of events and activities, which are all virtual this week due to the pandemic. For more information about activities and membership, please check the RSB website at rsb.org.uk. So, on this note, it is my distinct privilege to chair this afternoon's webinar. The webinar features an exciting set of talks addressing new research developments and directions being taken to address global issues affecting human disease and healthcare. Today's webinar is entitled, A Decade in Biology. What have the biosciences done for us? It is linked to the special issue of the journal, Emerging Topics in Life Science, published jointly with the Biochemical Society, Portland Press, and the Royal Society of Biology, celebrating the last 10 years of the Royal Society of Biology. We will now listen to Professor Richard Rees tell you more about this special issue. Hello, my name is Richard Rees. I'm Professor of Molecular Biology and Deputy Vice Chancellor at the University of Kent. In addition, I'm the Honorary Secretary of the Royal Society of Biology. I also had the enormous pleasure and privilege of guest editing the special issue of Emerging Topics in Life Sciences with a sub-theme of celebrating 10 years of the Royal Society of Biology. The biosciences have never been more important to both understanding and addressing global health, wealth and well-being. In the 10 years since the formation of the RSB, we have seen enormous changes in the pace of biological research and the ways in which this research impacts our everyday lives. Emerging Topics in Life Sciences is a journal published jointly by the Biochemical Society, Portland Press, and the Royal Society of Biology. As part of the Biology Week celebrations, we are providing free access to the latest issue until October the 11th. Today, we welcome a series of talks from different speakers who have contributed to the special issue and will cover topics including looking at various aspects of human health. You could read more about each of these areas and much more by going to the Emerging Topics in Life Sciences website. I hope that you enjoy the presentations. Thank you. In this webinar, we welcome three speakers who kindly contributed papers to this special issue and who are now providing talks showcasing what the biosciences have done for us. Unfortunately, our fourth invited speaker, Dr. James Cherry from UCLA, won't be able to join us today, but he will be presenting his talk, The Sociology of the Anti-Vaccine Movement, in one of our upcoming webinars on Wednesday, the 2nd of December at 1700 GMT. Registration will soon be available, so please keep an eye on the Biochemical Society's website at www.biochemistry.org webinar for more details. His presentation is guaranteed to garner great interest in view of the current decline in the coverage of childhood vaccinations, and also because fast-track vaccine development has taken center stage in the race to find therapeutics to contain the COVID-19 pandemic. Before I introduce our first speaker, please be aware that there will be a question and answer session at the end of each presentation. I encourage you to send in your questions during the talk. When you have a question, please type it in the question box as shown in the image on the screen. So without further ado, our first invited speaker today is Dr. Carl Fronsick. He is a consultant neuropathologist and senior researcher at the Institute of Neuropathology, University of Zurich, Switzerland. His scientific work is focused on immunological aspects of prion diseases. Today, he will be presenting his talk, 
recent developments in antibody therapeutics against prion disease. Dr. Franzik, the floor is yours. Uh, Patty, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Well, hello, everybody, and uh, I'm glad that you attended uh, this uh, seminar. Uh, I'm uh, happy to tell you something about uh, a topic that I have been researching for the last years, um, which uh, I will now summarize uh, in the presentation called uh, Recent Developments in Antibody Therapeutics Against Prion Diseases. As Patty said, I am a uh, consultant neuropathologist uh, at the Swiss National Reference Center of Prion Diseases. Uh, so uh, we um, handle the um, uh, humans that suffer from prion diseases in Switzerland. And uh, we also do research on uh, prion diseases. Um, to uh, disclose, uh, I received industry funding from UNO Pharmaceuticals and uh, public funding from University of Zurich and other Swiss and American uh, public foundations. Uh, so uh, I will. Uh, I would like to introduce you to prion diseases. Uh, so um, prion diseases are rare diseases. Uh, they uh, occur in humans uh, with an um, incidence of about uh, one or two patients per million inhabitants. Um, and um, uh, prion diseases are also called uh, transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. Um, uh, this is because uh, when you look at the brains of uh, patients succumbing to prion diseases, um, the brain has the very characteristic so-called spongiform or sponge-like uh, histology. Um, as you can see here, um, this is a um, uh, histological picture of a patient with prion diseases. Um, there is widespread uh, vacuolation, but also neuronal loss and uh, reactive gliosis of the central nervous system. Um, today, we believe that the cause of uh, prion diseases is uh, due to misfolding of the cellular prion protein, uh, which is uh, ubiquitously expressed in the brain and also extra neural organs in humans, um, and uh, by mechanisms that are not yet known. Uh, it uh, transforms towards uh, a pathological aggregated conformer, which is called the disease-causing prion, um, or also the scrapie prion. Um, today, uh, prion diseases are still in inevitably fatal diseases, and there is no cure yet. Um, so the prion uh, diseases have gained uh, strong um, uh, momentum uh, especially the research on the prion diseases during the MedCow uh, zoonotic, um, uh, which uh, happened uh, mostly in the UK and also other um, uh, other countries in Europe and uh, worldwide, um, by uh, transmission of uh, probably prion-infected um, uh, uh, cattle to uh, to humans. Um, since then, uh, there have been uh, many approaches. Uh, uh, mostly preclinical uh, pre to um, uh, treat prion diseases, um, starting with uh, antibody therapy, uh, which uh, is uh, uh, aimed at uh, stopping the conversion from the physiological to pathological protein, uh, but also to um, compounds targeting prion replication um, and eventually um, halting intracellular pathology, uh, such as um, uh, enhanced degradation of pathological proteins, um, as well as uh, chaperone therapy for um, uh, refolding of misfolded proteins and others. Um, so today, uh, my talk will be focused on antibody therapy, uh, as this also currently is uh, one of the two uh, therapeutic modalities where um, clinical trials are ongoing. Um, so to give you a, a brief recap about uh, what uh, therapies have been already tried against prion diseases. In the last uh, uh, 20 years, uh, there were three, uh, a total of three uh, controlled trials. Uh, so the furthest advanced was the doxycycline trial. Uh, doc doxycycline is actually an antibiotic. Uh, however, it was found that uh, doxycycline potently ablates uh, prion infectivity. Uh, so, uh, Hike and Al um, uh, performed a phase two study on uh, patients mostly with um, 
uh, sporadic uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakobs disease. Um, so uh, this is the most common uh, prion disease in humans. However, uh, after the first interim analysis, uh, the trial was cancelled because there was no benefit observable. Another drug, uh, which is called flupertin, uh, this is an analgesic, uh, was tested by Otto et al. in a similar setting as Hayek's study. While um, Otto et al. saw that there was a better cognitive function of uh, uh, patients receiving flupertin, the uh, survival times were mostly unchanged. Lastly, quinacrine, which is an antimalarial, uh, was tested by Michael Gishwin's uh, group and collaborators. Um, however, um, comparing um, to the results from Otto et al., uh, they also saw a slightly better cognitive function, but the survival times were unchanged. So, in the last years, uh, there um, was a paucity of um, trials against prion diseases. Um, however, there is currently two uh, trials which are um, ongoing, uh, one of which is uh, finished at the beginning of this year, um, namely um, a UK-based UK trial at the University College of London. Um, this is a PRN100, which is a humanized anti-PRPC antibody, uh, meaning that it targets the physiological prion protein. Um, this is a compassionate use trial in prion diseases, uh, which was finished, but the results are still undisclosed. And uh, more recently, um, this is from a group from the uh, Broad Institute in the USA. Um, um, this is a collaboration with Ionis Pharmaceuticals, um, uh, led by Eric Minnickel and Sonia Wallop, uh, where the um, preclinical stage showed evidence of um, effectivity of antisense oligonucleotides against the prion protein gene. So after having introduced you to the um, recent uh, developments in uh, overall therapeutic efforts, I want to now focus on uh, recent um, results uh, from the literature on um, anti-PRPC antibody therapy. Um, the effectiveness of therapeutic antibody Uh, uh, that happened in the last years. It was already discovered by Ruth Gabinson, who was uh, working in the group of Stanley Prusiner, who then uh, went on to get a Nobel Prize for this uh, discovery of prions. Um, so uh, what Ruth Gabinson actually did is um, she uh, purified the uh, scrapey prion protein, um, uh, which was back then um, uh, obtained by um, uh, digesting the um, pathological brains with the uh, proteinase. Uh, and then uh, she um, administered this um, uh, purified protein to hamsters and this antiserum then when given... Uh, we lost your sound temporarily. Oh, apologies. Um, so, as I said, um, uh, what uh, what they could see is um, on the right side you can see the control antibody, and this is uh, the gray color depicts the pathological prion protein, and the the um, administration of the therapeutic um, antibody uh, showed the reduction in the um, uh, prion aggregates, and also the mice uh, uh, were prevented from developing the disease. Um, so, what is then the, um, the mechanism of those antibodies? And actually, this was a study um, from uh, Adriana Guzzi as well, um, where um, Tiziana Sonati and co-workers um, tested uh, a battery of antibodies against the prion protein. Um, and um, uh, here is the schematic of those um, antibodies. And uh, you can appreciate that the, the left part is the N-terminus of the prion protein, which is unstructured, and there is a C-terminal, more globular part. And actually what Tiziana saw was that um, antibodies that are against the C-terminal globular part, uh, which is seen here, uh, for instance, POM1, uh, the C-terminal antibody, uh, wreaks havoc in the brain of uh, mice, while antibodies that are uh, directed against the uh, unstructured domain are not only innocuous, but also, um, which was then shown by um, another postdoc from this group, Uli Herman, 
uh, they um, were also protective against prion diseases. So then, uh, when I came to the lab, um, what we did, um, we uh, engineered um, uh, actually the first bispecific antibody for um, prion disease therapy, and we linked the protective POM2 antibody with the toxic POM1 antibody. And interestingly, uh, by blocking uh, both epitopes, uh, we could also see a potent uh, um, rescue of the prion pathology. Uh, and actually, this is, to our knowledge, the first antibody that was given when prion pathology was already evident and was still protected. So uh, what we then asked was, um, there is an even um, uh, there is a rare form of prion disease, which is co caused by genetic mutations. Um, and two examples are depicted here, which is gerstmann strauss schaikans disease, and the other one is fatal fam familial insomnia. And interestingly, those diseases, uh, they only manifest in high age, but these patients have the mutation uh, already at birth or even before. So uh, we were thinking if there are protective antibodies, maybe those patients have um, protective antibodies in the blood that uh, keep the um, disease on hold until high age when there is uh, too much of the pathological protein. But we were not successful and um, we did not find any um, elevated antibodies in patients with genetic prion diseases uh, when we compared them to their family members which did not have the mutation. But then we uh, were wondering, so if there are antibodies uh, which we saw in the genetic prion disease patients, um, maybe uh, if we look at the whole population, then um, somebody that would have these toxic antibodies, this person might suffer from a very severe neurological syndrome. Um, so uh, with Susie Senatore and Mark Emmenegger, we um, screened over 40,000 patients from the University Hospital here in Zurich. And um, we plotted then the reactivity of the antibody uh, uh, of the prion antibodies. And we could see that there was actually a small subset, which is all the black dots you see here, uh, that have those antiprion antibodies. Um, and when we looked at the age of these patients, we could see that they are, um, it's more uh, the older patients uh, uh, than the younger who have these antibodies. So, uh, however, when we looked at the clinical histories, we did not, uh, we were unsuccessful in doing a link between a disease suggesting that these antibodies are most likely innocuous. So, and this will be my last slide. Um, what is uh, now upcoming on the prion disease antibody side? Uh, this is unpublished data from our group, um, which is currently in revision. So, we have the crystal structure of the toxic uh, prion antibody when it is bound to prion protein. And um, the um, uh, interesting finding is that there is an H bond between these two alpha helices, uh, which is this arginine and a histidine, which is in close proximity to another alpha helix. However, uh, when there is no um, POM1 bound, there is uh, no H bond. So then we um, uh, mutated each of the binding residues from this toxic POM1 antibody and turned it to an alanine. And interestingly, in two antibodies, which is the Y57A and the Y104A, we could see that those uh, toxic antibodies are not uh, only innocuous, but also they're protective against prion diseases. And um, uh, when we um, uh, did um, uh, molecular dynamic simulation and also um, NMR spectroscopy, we could see that the presence of this H bond correlates positively with the toxicity of antibodies. So lastly, when we um, designed phages uh, that um, specifically uh, detected the uh, free conformation, but not this toxic conformation, we also came up with uh, antibodies that were also protective. And as you can see by the overlap, they seem to dock the similar uh, epitope as the toxic antibody. So just to sum up, we think that uh, the toxic antibodies and the real prions share a common site on the C-terminus of the prion protein by which they might exert the toxicity. So um, with this, I would like to thank all of collaborators, which is mostly at the University of Zurich, my PI, Adriano Guzzi, and uh, our collaborators at the Institute of Biomedicine, Dr. Luca Barani, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for that thoroughly engaging presentation.
I think as we age, we all harbor some fear of developing any form of neurodegenerative condition. So your presentation has kind of introduced a hopeful ray of light in the treatment of these human prion diseases. Can I start by asking you, you queried about, you were talking about the protective aspects of these perhaps autoantibodies to PRPC. Yeah. Are there any large-scale longitudinal studies in progress to look at this question in more detail and what kind of from what you're learning now, would you have antibody? Would you be looking at certain types of antibodies focusing on this region that you've determined to be perhaps neuroprotective? Right, uh, it's a good question. Uh, so actually, um, there is uh, not a longitudinal study ongoing per se, uh, but I can tell you what we also did, um, and. Um, so we mined the repertoires of um, publicly available immunoglobulin um, sequencing and actually we saw that there is uh, the sequences are quite similar to our protective antibodies so we have the impression that the um, uh, at least in uh, as subset of individuals there is the anti prion antibodies that are protective and uh, also what i can tell you uh, what we're looking at is um, uh, when we uh, designed these uh, protective antibodies, um, we think that uh, this age ledge uh, where the, um, the age bond is formed, uh, this would be a good target to develop a small molecule. So we're now planning to uh, do small molecule screens to specifically inhibit this, uh, this structural change. So, so are these antibodies then recognizing conformational elements more than sequence elements? Right, yes. So um, actually the first protective antibodies uh, where I told you there was an um, epitope uh, dependency, meaning the N-terminal were those that are protective. Um, there it's uh, linear epitopes. So, and um, the more recent uh, discovered are um, uh, um, uh, conformational epitopes. And actually, the one antibody which has been given to humans now is also a conformational uh, epitope to a similar region of uh, our protective antibody. I think maybe I have one last question for you. Um, can you comment on the delivery mode of getting these antibodies into the brain or how you would deliver? Right. So, um, uh, actually, um, I mean, of course, there is the um, usual route, which is intravenous injection, uh, which, uh, as you may know, takes uh, a, a lot of uh, amount of antibodies. Um, but something that I have not shown and uh, what we have, uh, it actually looks quite promising. Um, the mice are still healthy now. Uh, we have um, constructed uh, brain-specific adreno-associated viruses. So um, we give uh, adeno-associated viruses in the vein, but the root of action is only in the brain. And uh, we gave them now to pre-infected mice, and uh, we really hope that they survive for at least one, two weeks longer, and then we might see actually protection against prions. Well, thank you very much. We'll keep our fingers crossed with your research going forward. So thank you for the questions. Um, I think we're going to move on now to our next speaker. Our next invited speaker is Dr. Kim Hardy. She is an associate professor in the School of Life Sciences at the University of Nottingham, where her research group aims to decipher the complexity of polymicrobial biofilms, especially in the context of serious chronic infections and antimicrobial effectiveness. In collaboration, her group uses novel optical nanosensors and cutting edge technological platforms such as cryo orbisims to monitor environmental barriers to antimicrobial penetration using realistic infection models and couples this with molecular microbiology to unravel the mechanisms in order to find novel ways to overcome AMR and to identify potential new antimicrobial targets. Today, she will be presenting her talk antibiotic resistance. Dr. Hardy, I hand over to you. There we go. You're ready to go. Okay, so thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today um, about the fight against antimicrobial resistance in the last decade. The uh, I'm based at the University of Nottingham, as you said, and I've got some 
funding that was able to support some of the work presented here from the EU and also from Unilever. So um, antimicrobials are very good, as you can see in this video here. So they really work very well. So here we've got a bacteria which has got a green fluorescent protein put inside it. And so that's why it's showing the green light. And here you can see the antimicrobials being added and the lights going off. And they're so effective that they have come to underpin a number of routine um, surgeries and treatments for things like cancer. You can see in the building blocks building up here. And that we rely on them so much now that if they don't work anymore, then we really are in trouble. And there's lots of things that are going to have an effect on our well-being. And one of those would be the development of antimicrobial resistance. So there are a number of different antimicrobials that have been discovered, many of them at the beginning, um, just after the first one, penicillin, was found. And they represent a whole bunch of different chemistries. They also work in a number of different ways. So some of them don't enter the cell, they just attack the outside and make the cell weak or even burst them open. And others get inside and they can stop the genetic material being um, reproduced or they can interfere with the production of the protein building blocks or the metabolism of the cell and therefore the cells begin to die. Because they're so, so effective, we use an awful lot of them. So here's the tonnage usage um, over all sectors um, and these figures are from 2016. And you can see that very high levels in, in the States and Spain, which reflects their, their, their large use in animal agriculture at the time there. 10 years ago, this was such a, a big problem, recognized that it was um, predicted to be the next threat on a par with global warning. And the reasons for this is because once um, antibiotics come into um, the clinic, it's not very long afterwards that you see some antimicrobial resistance that is preventing them from being as effective as they could be. And the real wake up call came in 2017 when a patient died from Klebsiella pneumonia that was resistant to every available antibiotic in the US. And you can see the more recent ones that have been introduced have got a very short lag time before this resistance appears. So it's becoming a really big problem. But this antimicrobial resistance isn't just spontaneously appearing in the clinic. It actually was um, already um, present, but in the soil, for example, where you have lots of different microbes. And it's here, it's, it's suggested that it's used as competition against other microbes, or perhaps at low level production, even perhaps as a signaling molecule between antimicrobials. But because you have a mixed population, of cells that are in red resistant to antimicrobials and in green sensitive, if the level of the antibiotic rises, then the sensitive ones will die off, leading the resistance ones, which can take over the environment, multiplying and having a selective advantage. With them so many of them around, they might come in contact with other microbes, and this antimicrobial resistance can be transferred between microbes. And this is usually done by the transfer of um, uh, genetic material from one bacteria to another. And this is, becomes our real problem when it starts to happen within the clinic. Because we've got the variation in the function of the antimicrobials, we also have a lot of different variation in the way that the resistant mechanisms work. Some of them prevent the entry of antimicrobials, or if they get in, they pump them out. Others affect the actual target of the antimicrobial or inactivate uh, inactivate it. They can change the target so that it no, no longer fits the antimicrobial. They could also produce a different version of the step so that the antimicrobial inhibited process is bypassed, or it could involve overproduction of the target, which dilutes the effect of the antimicrobial. So, um, we used to think that this was really fast um, spread. So the beta lactamase um, that was discovered in, in New Delhi spread throughout the world in, in less than a decade. But now we know that pandemics can um, spread even faster. So maybe that's not as scary as we thought, but it's still pretty scary if a new one came along. 
because it would have such a big impact on us all. But this sparked um, a, a review in 2016, a report by Jim O'Neill, which used the current figures of 700,000 deaths per year from antimicrobial resistance to predict what would happen if this multiplied across the globe. And in the end, it predicted there would be 10 million antimicrobial resistance causing deaths globally per year, um, which would have a very high um, financial as well as um, well-being impact on us all. So the O'Neill report had, a, had 10 recommendations. And since that came out for four years ago, there has been some movement. So there is... Um, some positive change in that numerous international AMR awareness initiatives have been launched and there's a reduced um, use of antimicrobials in agriculture and in dentistry which is helping to keep down the emergence of the antimicrobial resistance in the clinic and everybody was becoming a little bit more aware about hygiene but what was remaining at this point was um, the, the need to um, incentivize the research and transform it so that it was more effective to find new antimicrobials and to understand the antimicrobial resistance. And the reason that uh, you need incentives to develop more antimicrobials is because it costs a lot of money to generate one, do the research, isolate it, purify it and produce it. And yet it would be kept on the back bench on, on, the, on the top shelf for use in dire circumstances when everything else has already um, been exhausted. There's also an issue with low to middle income countries because in these countries, the antibiotic product, um, prescription is not tightly regulated. So people can easily get hold of antibiotics. And so there's a lot more in circulation. And also there's um, reduced sanitation and hygiene in these places as well, and maybe even um, linked into the refugee crisis, the, the moving of people around the globe, that means that um, more antimicrobial, uh, that there's less fighting against the infectious diseases and therefore there's more need for the use of antimicrobials. And whilst there's more hygiene awareness, uh, there is a need to get that actually embedded into real time behavioural change. And alongside that, there was recognised a need to keep survey, surveying the use of antimicrobials and the spread of an AMR so that it can be um, counteracted and to develop rapid diagnostics because then that means that if you can quickly um, diagnose that you've got a bacterial infection and you can quickly link that to its antimicrobial sensitivity, you can then target the use of the antimicrobials where it's really needed. And the, in the UK, a strategy in, 20, in the beginning of 2019 was brought in that addressed some of these things by setting targets for the reduction of drug resistant infections, although it didn't make completely clear how this um, surveillance was going to be monitored and which drugs it was actually going to be involving. There was also quite a lot of um, progress in making goals to reduce the amount of um, use of the antimicrobials in humans and also in animals, but it was not um, made clear how this would integrate with changes that would come about post Brexit. And to target the need for money in the development of the antimicrobials, um, it was proposed that a, a new payment model would be brought in and there was some suggestion that it might be of a life insurance model kind of payment where instead of thinking of the the price of the antimicrobials being linked to the volumes that would be used you would think of the price being linked to how much damage would occur if they weren't used to make them more viable so um there's clearly more to do. They can't just rely on the um, strategy. Um, and there are some movements, for example, a new hygiene improvement policy was brought out in the UK. And this was to make sure that there was standardized um, practice brought in again across all the healthcare 
staff and to support them in their common understanding of the importance of this. And there's a lot of buy-in to tackle antimicrobial resistance. So there's citizen science and sharing of resources and also ways to show that you're um, in favour of action on this side. And back in 2019, um, we were thinking that the next greatest um, battle in our fight against antimicrobial resistance would be the realisation that most of the bacteria don't actually live free living in liquid, but they actually come together to form complex communities on surfaces. And these surfaces really vary. They're in the environment, such as in pipes or in the domestic washing machine, on your teeth, on you, and on indwelling devices. And the problem with these communities is they have bacteria embedded in a matrix and the antimicrobials can't penetrate very well, very well through this matrix, which means they can't reach the antimicrobials in the middle. There's also altered environments in this matrix, which might change the way that the antimicrobial work. And the bacteria within them are exposed to stresses and may even develop into a dormant persistent state stage when they wouldn't actually succumb to the effect of the antimicrobial. So understanding about biofilms was um, very important. And here we see some of our data where we've com compared the sensitivity to three living bacteria to inhibit their growth in blue, four different bacteria, both pathogens that are not so good and commensals that are quite friendly. And that, that dose is quite low compared to the amount that you would need to kill these bacteria. But that pales into the insignificance, really, against the amount of antimicrobial, in this case, ciprofloxacin, that would be needed to kill the bacteria when they're in the biofilm. So the reason, as I said, was to do with the penetration of the antimicrobials through the um, biofilm microcolonies. And you can hear, see here a fluorescent microscopy image where you've got dead bacteria on the outside of a microcolony which have been hit by the antimicrobial but still living ones in the centre, which is what gives the selective conditions for antimicrobial resistance. In addition, because um, biofilm communities can survive for a long time, they will get um, exposed to more than one type of um, antimicrobial, and there can be combination effects. So, for example, this biocide triclosan is in many household products, including the washing that's used to decolonize um, before um, surgery. And the issue with this is that it builds up in the body, and it can be seen that while ciprofloxacin can really kill this bacteria here very quickly, and you can see that visually on a petri dish there, if the bacteria are pre-treated with triclosan, they survive. And you can't see any difference in that number there of colonies that are growing. So that shows that the combination effect is something that we have to consider in our treatment of, with antimicrobials in the, in, the, in the future to prevent the development of resistance or tolerance against them. And so back then there was a uh, lot of um, research ongoing into new antimicrobials, looking to understand the biofilm architecture, the niches of the environment, and so to develop new antimicrobials that work much better. Um, to change the surfaces on which they're growing as well so that they don't grow. So for example, the indwelling devices like catheters can be coated with polymers or their topology can be changed so that biofilms no longer form on them. And what we need to know is how these biofilms and their antimicrobial resistance correlates with the clinical outcome and also how to diagnose where the biofilms are because you don't want to treat with a different strategy if there's actually no biofilm there. And it's becoming more and more evident that more than one microbe might be present in a biofilm and that one can influence the resistance to antimicrobials um, of another organism. And then something else happened. Along came a pandemic. And this really um, made us think about whether the antimicrobial resistance was still an issue or not. But back in April, Laurie Burroughs presented this really nice figure where she took the number of deaths by, from COVID-19 at the time, compared them to the annual death of, by, from flu 
cancer and the predicted 2050 death from AMR um, in as well. And you can see it pales into insignificance. And taking the value of the number of deaths yesterday into consideration, okay, we're a bit more than we were for flu there, but we're still a very small amount compared to the predicted amount of deaths from ANR. So the next question becomes, how is the pandemic affecting the number of deaths from AMR? And there's some reports that it's actually making it worse because there are um, more use of the antibiotics, so therefore more selective pressure for antimicrobial resistance based on an unknown cure for the COVID and also the reports, for example, this one that's coming out of the media, that came out in the media, that antibiotics might be effective. In addition to that, there are a number of cases of um, severe secondary bacterial infections that needed to be treated. And because they were in such ill patients, you'd get empirical treatment, not necessarily based on the sensitivity of the secondary infection, which means that the antibiotic isn't being used where it might be most needed. And on top of that, because many of the initial consultations with GPs are via the telephone, they err on, on the side of caution to prescribe the antibiotic, which means that more will be being used where they're not really needed. There's also an issue that will affect the, the treatment with antibiotics, which might not be in, in, um, initially apparent, and that is that many of the countries severely affected by the pandemic are the major suppliers of the antibiotics. And then there was proposed to be a number of other uh, knock-on effects. Um, for example, the, the activity towards the pandemic means there's less surveillance on AMR, delays in registration, withdrawal from WHO support, um, low public awareness of the AMR, and also fatigue for the crisis. But it's not all bad news. Um, also proposed is that there are a number of opportunities to fight AMR buried within the, the onslaught of the pandemic. So there will be some money going into infectious diseases that could be used um, for surveillance. There will be new diagnosed, diagnostics because they're really needed. There's also the awareness that we need to think about transmission from the environment or from animals to the human chain. Different legislations are, are going through. And also there's been a lot of public um, information campaigns which are gonna help in raising the awareness of hygiene measures. And for example, as far as hand hygiene um, is evolved, I'm sure you're all aware of the government announcements social media, celebratory uh, demonstrations from normal media and publications that give you the full um, information you need to do your hand hygiene really well and when you need to do it. So th there is also hope because there's been lots of research so after the over the last decade, the amount of publications in AMR has doubled. And this has been a result partly of using state-of-the-art methodology and multidisciplinary science. And much of it's been shared freely online, which helps it to be um, disseminated. And there has also been a report about how beneficial it is to incorporate creative disciplines like art and architecture into the fight against AMR. So that might be another way forward. The other ways forward will be on new treatments, new antimicrobials. And we might be able to find these by looking through old drugs that have gone through all the trials and so therefore they're safe but then they may be not as effective against um, the, the syndrome that they were designed against and repurpose them for killing antimicrobials. Um, there may be some clues in ancient remedies like medieval remedies that we might be able to reinvent and we might be able to get through these um, different compounds by using artificial and intelligence as it's um, developed and one study has already found a useful antimicrobial by using AI to go through more than 100 million different compounds. There are different strategies as well. I mentioned how polymicrobial um, communities have an effect on each other so we might be able to harness our friendly microbiome 
to fight against pathogens and also to target um, processes in the pathogens that are not essential, that will not uh, generate so much um, resistance, like to have an antivirulence factor um, molecule to combat the microbes. And then we might want to actually inject something into the microbe rather than um, use chemicals. For example, the, the viruses that affect microbes might be able to be deployed to reduce the amount of microbes um, in an infection like a wound for bacteriophages. Or we might want to actually develop new vaccines so that we can inject ourselves and have the prevention rather than cure. But overall, it seems that to be able to fully overcome AMR, we need to work globally and collaboratively in the way that um, we're learning through the, through the pandemic, because the low to middle income uh, countries face significant and specific changes that require solutions before we're going to be fully effective. And we need to build on what we know from the pandemic to embrace the One Health dimension and think about the environment and animals as the source of the antimicrobials and the antimicrobial resistance that um, is a problem to us. Finally, I'd like to thank the people in my lab. Um, so I, I highlighted the people who'd done some of the data generation that I looked at before. And um, with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Kim. That was an excellent summary of the AMR problem and the strategies that are being taken to, to uh, fight this problem. Great, now we can see you, thank you. Okay, so the first question I have for you is in regards to AMR, what does it mean for our current situation with COVID? Are we using too much sanitizer or antibiotics to fight it? The speaker realizes it's a virus, but are we killing good competitive bacteria? So what we might be doing is what I mentioned about the trickler sand. So in the in the sanitizers, there may be compounds that are creating tolerance or resistance in the microbes, and therefore making it harder for the antibiotics to work. Um, but the the steer there would be to um, encourage people to use normal soap rather than uh, ones with extra additives. Um, and it's a bit of a mixed bag about whether we're using more antimicrobials or not, but it does look like um, they are being used more as a, well, you have to make a quick decision. You've got a very ill person, you don't really know what's going to make them better. The antimicrobial might do, but you're going to use a broad range one, which is going to then have an effect on lots of organisms, providing a selected advantage for the resistance, which is going to exacerbate the problem. Does that make sense? So I have another question for you. To what extent is our bioactive natural compounds, can they contribute to the control of AMR and to novel ways of finding multi-drug resistant bacteria? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's part of the um, microbes on a, microbiology on Earth, getting everybody involved in trying to get natural environment samples so that we can perhaps find novel antimicrobials or, or, or maybe even find resistant mechanisms that we can study, understand and try and find ways around. So absolutely, I think different environments are going to unearth different antimicrobials. Okay, there's a question about new diagnostics underway this year. I'm not quite sure if you have any um, um, all I, I don't know about any specifics, I just know that there's a big drive that we need to overcome, you know, we need to take part in to get new diagnostics because it's absolutely vital we know what is causing whatever the symptoms are and how, what the antimicrobial sensitivity profile of that organism is so that we can use targeted antimicrobial therapy to safeguard the antimicrobials and to stop imposing a selection pressure. Okay, uh, last question. Um, azithromycin is used extensively beside the other drugs for COVID-19 patients during the pandemic. Are we expecting a new era of AMR to come? A new, oh, 
I don't know if we could do. Um, certainly we might um, reduce the shelf life of the azithromycin because if it gets used more and an existence an existing resistance mechanism is more selective for and more Okay. Thank you very much for your time and we'll move on to the next speaker. We may have time for more questions at the end. Okay, so our last speaker today is Dr. Olivier Elemento. He is director of the Englander Institute for Precision Medicine, an institute that uses genomics and informatics to make medicine more individualized. His team have developed a systematic approach to create tumor organoids across 12 tumor types and to use high throughput screening to identify optimal patient-specific anti-cancer tra treatment options. The focus of his research group is the system's biology of cancer. They focus on prostate cancer and hematological malignancies. Dr. Elemento is also Associate Program Director of the Clinical and Translational Science Center and Associate Director of the Institute for Computational Medicine. His talk is entitled the future of precision medicine towards a more predictive personalized medicine. Dr. Elemento. Thank you. All right, so it's a uh, wonderful, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm uh, delighted to um, get a chance to tell you about our work in, in precision medicine and more generally speaking about the field of precision medicine and how it's evolving, how it's changing. Um, so um, I'm going to start my talk by disclosures. Um, please, um, you know, take a look at my disclosures and uh, and, uh, and 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 sort of get a sense of some of the potential conflicts. Uh, some, I think, most of them will not really related to the to the talk today. Um, I'd like to start my talks by um, giving a definition of precision medicine. Um, precision medicine is essentially a different, a new form of personalized medicine that I believe is driven by technology. Um, technology such as whole genome sequencing that allows us to sequence uh, somebody's genome in just a few hours now, uh, and in fact can actually uh, allow sequencing of uh, many, many genomes at the same time. Um, but as you'll see in the second part of the talk, um, precision medicine is also more and more driven by data analytics and AI uh, and a combination of these, uh, of these, uh, these technologies is, is really, um, and, and really, that will be the, the the crux of the of a talk is really making uh, medicine uh, more predictive. Um, I also like to um, remind everyone that precision medicine um, relies on the availability availability of large cohorts as a way to learn how to connect, for example, genotypes and phenotypes. Um, using whole genome sequencing and sequencing in general, we can now sequence thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of individuals. Um, and by gathering information about phenotypes, what disease they have, uh, you know, what disease they had in the past, we can make a connection, a robust connection between um, things that you measure in clinical samples, such as the DNA, and uh, the occurrence of a particular phenotype. Uh, once you've made those connections, then you can apply these connections to individual patients. Um, but again, you know, you really need to start with large cohorts to be able to learn how to make these connections before you uh, before you apply. So I'd like to say that precision medicine is learning from many and applying to one. Uh, precision medicine is being applied to cancer. It's being it's being applied to all kinds of disease, but you know, from a more historical way, it's been applied to cancer maybe first before and before any other disease. Um, the concept of precision medicine in, in in cancer typically involves doing a biopsy, so getting cells uh, from the tumor. Uh, also getting normal cells, for example, from the blood, uh, and then sequencing the DNA of the tumor cells and sequencing the DNA of the normal cells from the same patient. The analysis of this DNA uh, is, is focused on the identification of mutations, uh, changes in the DNA that are specific to the tumor cells and not found in normal cells from the same individual. Um, so that's what we do when we do this at Cornell. It's being done in, in pretty much all hospitals now uh, in, in, uh, in a lot of different uh, countries. And involves, as I say, DNA sequencing. As you'll see, also more and more involves additional types of measurements on these uh, tumor biopsies. One of them is, for example, the analysis of RNA, which is, you know, the genes that are expressed within the tumors. And I'll show you examples of how it helps in terms of understanding better the tumor and what's driving uh, each individual uh, cancer. 
Um, this information is summarized into a report uh, and then used as a way to make personalized recommendations for patients based on the DNA of the cancers. Uh, and so what we see when we sequence uh, people's cancer genome is that every cancer is different. When two people um, get breast cancer, even though it, it is the same name, when you look at the mutations that drive a cancer in these two individuals, they are very often quite different from each other. Uh, and hence the importance of uh, understanding through DNA sequencing what these uh, uh, tumors look like. So here is an example of a report that we use to um, convey the information uh, of, of the, the tumor genome back to physician. Uh, so essentially it's a list of mutations uh, that we prioritize, sort of sort based on importance. Uh, we have the most important mutations at the top and less important mutations uh, at the bottom. As you can see, um, most tumors that we sequence have quite a few mutations. So the challenge is to find these important mutations uh, in, in, the, uh, in the context of lots of maybe less uh, important mutations. Um, as I said, what we do more and more is to not only sequence the DNA, but also sequence the RNA. That allows us, for example, to credential certain mutations. Um, this is a complex slide here, but it shows uh, a report of a patient where we found a mutation in a gene called RB2. Uh, we wanted to know whether this mutation was really active in this one patient, because um, not all mutations are active. They can be inherited from the past. You know, as tumors evolve, they can inherit mutations. Uh, but what we did we, was to analyze the RNA of the same tumor where we found the mutation. And when we look for genes that are known to be downstream uh, of, of, of this mutation, of a gene that has this mutation, we found that all those genes were actually quite highly expressed. So it gives us confidence that this gene called RB2 here was actually really doing something in this tumor because it was, it was activating an entire expression program that's known to be downstream of this, uh, of this mutation. So the combination of these two uh, modalities is very powerful in terms of uh, credentialing mutations. This is an example here of what we can do once we find those mutations. Uh, this is a patient with a hot amplification. It's actually the same gene that I just showed you. Uh, this, mutation had, this mutation was uh, found to be amplified in this one patient. Um, this, is a, this is a patient here with bladder cancer. So typically, not a, not a patient where you find this kind of mutation. You find this mutation often in breast cancer. Uh, but because this patient had very few options, our physicians decided to give that bladder cancer patient the breast cancer drug. It's called Herceptin. Uh, and as you see here in this patient, it had essentially a, a very sort of profound effect. It was able to completely eradicate uh, tumors that had uh, you know, this mutation. So understanding what's driving individual cancers allows us to treat the cancers in a very personalized way uh, as a result of being able to match it with specific drugs. Here is another patient with the same mutation, uh, same breast cancer mutation, but here found in a, a uterine cancer, uh, and also treated with Herceptin, the same drug that I showed you earlier, and likewise, you know, also showing a very good response. So those two um, examples of patients are showing also a very sort of strong phenomenon in cancer now, which is that we're starting to move away from defining cancer based on where it's located in the body towards specifically what cancer, what mutations are actually driving the cancer. Uh, and as a result of this kind of focus or change in focus, uh, several organ agnostic um, biomarker-driven anti-cancer drugs have been approved by the FDA. These drugs have been shown to be effective uh, in patients that have a specific mutation, no matter where the, the tumor is found in the body. It could be, you know, a bladder, a bladder tumor, it could be a, a, colon, a colon tumor. You know, these drugs tend to be effective, um, whatever the, the, the location, but if the mutation has a particular mutation. And there are several drugs like this now. Um, so this is sort of where we are. This is where the field is at now in terms of uh, genomics and and, uh, and utilization of uh, DNA sequencing as well as RNA sequencing, as I showed you. What I wanted to in the next few slides is to give you a sense of where the field is going. As I said, you know, my belief is that the field is moving towards a more predictive form of personalized medicine, uh, and that actually very much involves uh, the second part of this figure that I showed earlier, which is the utilization of AI uh, and, and data and data analytics. Um, so this is something that we've been doing here at Cornell in my group for some time. Uh, a few years ago, we showed that using a form of AI called uh, superconductor machine, uh, we could uh, diagnose very precisely whether a thyroid lesion, basically a, a, a lesion that you find in the thyroid in some individuals, which tend to be pretty common, uh, some of these lesions are malignant, some of them are benign. Uh, we showed that using the analysis of microRNAs, which are tiny genes that you find uh, in tumor cells as well as normal cells, combined using a machine learning approach, as I say, called supervector machine, you could actually achieve a diagnosis accuracy of about 90%. Uh, 
Uh, so this was kind of our first uh, foray into the, the field of AI and machine learning applied to precision medicine. And since then, we've actually applied this to many, to many different problems. One of them was to, for example, predict uh, which patients are, uh, are going to respond to immunotherapy. Immunotherapy, as you know, is the ability to uh, revive the immune system to target cancer cells, a very promising form of therapy for cancer, but unfortunately, it does not work in many cancer patients. Uh, so the challenge in the field has been to find the patients who are likely responders to immune therapy. What we showed in this paper, and this is something we're continuing to do research about, is that the integration of data that you get from patients and the biopsy results for whole, the DNA sequencing, the RNA sequencing, the integration of these data to, using a machine learning method, also uh, called a random forest in this particular case, was actually able to build a predictor that can predict responders with about uh, close to 90% accuracy. And we show that it's only by combining the different signals that you get from throughout the genome and the genes that are expressed that you can actually reach this kind of performance in terms of prediction. Uh, so again, this is you know the the, the future of uh, of uh, sort of precision medicine is really the data integration for multiple signals that give you a full picture about um, the the uh, the likelihood of response uh, to particular drugs of of, uh, of certain patients. We're moving away from using one marker at a time, using a combination of markers uh, combined and integrated using machine learning and AI. Um, machine learning is uh, is used uh, now in the form of deep neural networks um, very much uh, as a way to not only analyze genomic data, DNA data and, and RNA data, but also analyze medical imaging data. Uh, this is exciting to me because this is a source of data that's readily available. You know, there's a tremendous amount of uh, medical data that's in the medical records of, you know, uh, sort of pretty much all patients, for example, for patients who get cancer. And, you know, we think there is an opportunity to uh, combine this data with maybe genomics data as a way to deliver better, more precise precision medicine. So again, this kind of AI is really completely driven by the availability of these deep neural networks, um, which very often are pre-trained. What it means by pre-training is that they are pre-trained on lots of different images, so they are pre-trained to understand, you know, certain fundamental concepts about images, such as, you know, textures, you know, objects, and so on. And what we do is to retrain them on medical images, and we don't necessarily need a lot of medical images to do so, just because we have uh, you know, already pre-trained those networks on, on large uh, data sets. So these data sets are being used to analyze all kinds of medical imaging data. Uh, and this, these are things that we do also in my group and then with my, uh, my collaborators here at Cornell. Uh, we apply this to histopathology, which is the analysis of tissue to enable diagnosis. We apply this to radiology, which is, uh, as, you, as you can see here, it's analysis of organs uh, at, at a resolution that allows you to find, for example, certain tumors. Um, one thing that we did a few years ago was to demonstrate that um, deep learning applied to histology, which is again tissue sections from uh, cancer, for example, stain in a way to reveal cancer cells and the morphology of cancer cells. Uh, AI can actually be used and trained on this kind of images to distinguish between two types of lung cancer. This was one of the first applications of AI to histology, demonstrating that you can essentially uh, achieve extremely good accuracy in terms of distinction between two types of cancers that are actually quite similar to each other. But AI is able to pick up signals that can distinguish these, uh, these, uh, these types of cancers. We showed then we can apply um, a, the same kind of AI to breast cancer to identify different subtypes of breast cancer based, again, on HNE, based on histopathology slides. We also showed that uh, in, uh, a few years ago, working with, uh, with a company, that you can use AI, the same kind of deep, deep neural networks, as a way to predict prognosis, for example, in mesothelioma are better, again, than, than, uh, than uh, everything that have been sort of done before, again, by integrating data from these images, and, and we had a lot of them in this particular case. One exciting uh, application of AI is the ability to connect different types of, of imaging, for example, radiology and histology. Uh, one thing that we used AI for was the application of AI to prostate cancer in this particular case. We're trying to uh, show that we can predict the result of a biopsy of a prostate uh, for somebody with prostate cancer just based on radiology images. We had a large data set where we had both radiology images and uh, histology with a Gleason score um, uh, and an assessment of the aggressive nature of the cancer. And we showed that using AI, we can actually map one into the other. What it shows is that essentially we can uh, move towards an, a future where we don't necessarily need to do a biopsy because we learned how to train an AI to analyze the radiology images to basically reproduce the result of a biopsy. So that's very exciting and, and definitely ongoing work that you know we're trying to expand to other diseases as well. 
And the, the, these applications uh, of um, imaging uh, not only focus on cancer. For example, we've also showed uh, last year that we, you can use the same kind of neural network as a way to analyze different types of medical imaging data. For example, data from an IVF uh, treatment center here at Cornell. We had lots of embryos that were fertilized, you know, human embryos, uh, images that you see here. Some of them uh, were going to be implanted and, and uh, would give rise to, uh, to a live birth after IVF, some of them wouldn't do so, we were able to train an algorithm to be able to distinguish good embryos that are going to be successful versus poor embryos that are not going to be so successful. Again, pointed to the idea that you can essentially kind of tack on uh, uh, AI to this kind of medical imaging as a way to personalize uh, the analysis of these images uh, and, and improve hopefully the, uh, the, 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 the outcomes using, uh, using this kind of data. So this is sort of, you know, the, the, basically the, the end of the talk. I, what I wanted to give you a sense, um, I only had a few minutes, but I'm, I'm hoping I was able to give you a sense that multi-scale data integration, genomics, imaging, for example, combined and integrated using AI is making precision medicine more predictive. And, you know, obviously this is a great thing for patients. You know, this means more personalized medicine uh, for everyone. And this is, uh, we think that this is very exciting. So I'll stop here uh, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much for your truly captivating presentation, showing us how precision medicine could, or actually will affect our, or is, affecting our healthcare future. So first question I have for you here is, um, will informaticians become our future medical diagnosticians? Perhaps this would be a career opportunity for consideration. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. I don't think that's going to be the case because obviously you know, a pathologist and like you said, diagnostician in general, obviously have a lot of uh, medical expertise that, you know, they use as a way to uh, not only so analyze, you know, this kind of data, but also, you know, sort of, uh, uh, sort of communicate information to the patients and so on. And, and obviously integrate, you know, lots of decades of, of education in order to uh, combine, you know, sort of um, certain type of data with, with other things that they know about the patient. Um, but, uh, you know, I do think that informatics is going to be more integrated into uh, the medical system in general, make the medical system more predictive. And I do think that um, more and more diagnosticians are going to rely on these kind of systems as a way to be more productive and, and be more performant. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think this is a great part of the future. I think that, uh, you know, Again, the, uh, the the skills, you know, uh, building skill sets in, in terms of informatics and being able to interact better with machines uh, and understand the result of an AI prediction, uh, you know, is going to be critical in terms of, for example, medical, medical education. I have a question here. How likely is this technique like to give false positives? Right. So, I mean, this, this some of these techniques, uh, uh, depending on the sort of, you know, the, the performance of the algorithms, indeed do give false positives and, and false negatives. Um, but, you know, just keep in mind that everything that we do now in the medical system also does. Uh, so I think there's, you know, multiple um, uh, sort of studies that have shown that, uh, for example, in the diagnosis of melanomas, you know, from images of moles, um, the, these, uh, this kind of AI uh, applied to thousands and thousands of images gives rise to, you know, to, to performances that are comparable, if not better than what uh, humans sort of, you know, could do. And you know, and, and humans are not by no means perfect at uh, at uh, at uh, making these diagnoses. You know, everybody makes mistakes from time to time, and this is you know absolutely part of the uh, part of uh, sort of uh, the issue. And we think that AI has a possibility to interact, basically collaborate with human beings. That's a way to make the human beings more 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 performant. So related to that, I have a question: Is computational power becoming a bottleneck? Yeah, so I mean, it is um, because our ability to generate data is really now, um, you know, very, very sort of uh, substantial. Um, and imaging data actually requires specific types of uh, computational infrastructure called GPUs, these are these graphical processor units. Um, so we actually do see bottlenecks in terms of being able to train AI models uh, for analyzing images uh, because we don't necessarily always have enough access to those, uh, to these kind of computers. Um, it is a, a tractable problem in some ways, uh, but it is an important problem. And, uh, you know, to be able to uh, to uh, sort of deploy AI at scale and, and learn from, you know, extremely large data sets, more and more you need access to very large computing power that you know, is not always available to everyone. Another question for you is, is there any way you could make precision medicine more accessible for third world countries? 
Yeah, and that's a wonderful question, and I absolutely completely embrace you know this idea. You know, I think that a lot of the precision medicine that exists now is not broadly accessible. You know, even you know within the U.S., for example, there are centers that are just not equipped that haven't had a chance to invest in the same kind of, for example, even sequencing uh, type of analysis that I showed at the beginning. Uh, so I think there's a need to uh, decrease the cost of these assays. They are still expensive for a variety of different reasons. They're not accessible enough. Uh, so I think there is a very strong need to uh, decrease the cost and make these uh, this kind of medicine more accessible. It is the future of, of medicine in general, uh, but we need to make sure that it's accessible to everyone and absolutely indeed uh, to other countries that uh, don't necessarily have, you know, the, the right now the infrastructure that uh, that we have here in a, in, a, in a more modern country. Right. I would like to thank you very much. And I think uh, owing to the time now, I'd like to thank you, doc, uh, Dr. Alimento, Drs. Franzek and Hardy for the time they've spent sharing their research and all of the thought-provoking presentations. Before I end the meeting, I would like to close with a few announcements. First, I'd like to thank everyone for attending the webinar and the speakers for their presentations. You can continue the conversation online. Follow at BioCamSoc and at PP Publishing on Twitter. We welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in this biochemistry focused webinar series. We invite you to submit a proposal if you have an idea for an upcoming webinar. You can find more information about the webinars and propose your webinar on www.biochemistry.org webinars. Join us for the next webinar in the series entitled Open Access, Ask Me Anything on Wednesday the 14th of October at 1500 BST, ahead of Open Access Week. Ask your questions and have them answered by a panel able to share perspectives from an institution, researchers at different career stages, and a publisher. In these new and challenging times, it's more important than ever to stay connected. It's an extraordinary time for all of us, but it's also an exciting time to join the Biochemical Society as they look to expand their online activities. Join their community of researchers and specialists to stay connected and take advantage of key benefits, including discounted registration fees for society courses and meetings, exclusive access to a wide range of grants and bursaries, personal online access, and two other journals and more. Visit their website and more. And so, in closing, thank you to all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.